there's a new spin on casual dining near Drake University. Lucky Horse Beer and Burgers. Craveable faves, flatbreads, delicious burgers, frozen cocktails, a crazy cool vibe. Get to Lucky Horse Beer and Burgers today. News on YourIowa.com is brought to you by the Commission on U.S. Territories, striving for equal representation around the globe, and by Keep Iowa First, committed to keeping the Iowa caucuses the first in the nation contest in selecting the presidency of the United States. And now, here's your host, Brent Rosky. Good morning, everybody. It is the 1st of February. You made it through January. We're 112th finished with this year already. Folks, to keep it in perspective, take a look at this. Clay Masters over at Iowa Public Radio. Hillary Clinton and Ted Cruz won the Iowa caucuses five years ago today. Uh, if you remember right, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders were neck and neck, and Hillary Clinton made a speech saying that she won. Um, I remember exactly where I was. I'd spent Basically, five years solid in politics before that, finished that, those uh, caucuses right there, followed, uh, I went to the Nevada caucuses, uh, and then back in California, met Dana, now here we are. Uh, today's show, um, we are going to be talking with Phil Berger. Take a look at this uh, poster here, folks. That is Auschwitz. Uh, Phil made a stunning movie called The Barn. Uh, that is... The people in the photo there, uh, that is Carl Shapiro and his granddaughter, Rachel. Uh, this is one family story of survival. You are not going to want to miss uh, my conversation with the director of that film. Uh, and right after that, we're going to be chatting with uh, former state representative Karen Derry is going to be with us. Always on Mondays with her uh, update from the Iowa Capitol to see what's going on there. Wednesday's show this week, uh, there she is, Andreen Ward-Hammond, uh, there with Brian Cranston. Uh, they're on a program called Your Honor on Showtime. Andreen is going to be with us on Wednesday. Couldn't be uh, happier about that. And, uh, you know... <laughs> Next week, we're going to, that's uh, Oscar nominee Ray Fiennes. He's actually in a documentary called Coup 53, which is a, which is a film about uh, the CIA and MI6 uh, overthrowing the Iranian government uh, back in uh, 1953. And you think, oh, coups are so far away. Who really does that sort of thing anymore? Well, uh, last night in Myanmar, uh, there was a military coup. And this footage here, uh, this is actually Brendan Gutenschwager. This is from January 6th at our U.S. Capitol. And it's so important uh, that we not lose sight of this uh, and how, uh, you know, dramatic it, it could have gotten. Even I mean, look at this. This, this footage has been slowed down. The person who filmed this footage, uh, Brendan, is actually going to be with us on the show. We're scheduled for Thursday. It was going to be on last week. We had to push it to this week. Uh, but last night in Myanmar, there was a military coup. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, he expressed grave concern and alarm over this coup. Uh, in his statement, he said the United States stand with uh, the people of Burma, which is now called Myanmar, in their aspirations for democracy, freedom, peace, and development. He's asking for the military there to reverse their actions immediately. And Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Prize winner, she's actually the head of the NLD there, the National League for Democracy. She has been detained again, uh, as you may remember. She spent almost 15 years under house arrest when the military government uh, nullified the results of the 1998 election there. Um, but in 2015, her party won in a landslide. And, you know, due to a it's a, it's a clause in their constitution that she can't be named the president because her late husband and children are actually foreign citizens. So they came up with a new role for her. They call her the state counselor of Myanmar. And they're saying that's similar to what could be a prime minister or head of government. She has now been detained by the Myanmar military who, as of yesterday, um, took over control of that country. So again, next week, we are going to be chatting with the director of this documentary about uh, the coup that happened uh, to bring 
uh, down the uh, Mossadiq regime um, and give power back to the Shah uh, in Iran. Some uh, amazing footage uh, that he was able to get. Um, so you're going to want to see that. Uh, so uh, The Barn is a chilling uh, film about the Holocaust, about one family uh, and what one of their uh, members of the family had to do to survive. I'm going to show you the trailer and then we're going to sit down uh, and chat with the director. Uh, I taped this uh, interview just a few days ago, but here's the trailer for The Barn and then my interview with Phil Berger. What's your earliest memory? What's the first thing that you remember if you go back all the way in your head? This is the street where your family lived before the war. Does any of this look familiar to you? I was born in 1934, southeast Poland, near the Carpathian Mountains. You knew something was wrong. That's right, but I didn't ask. And then we hear the roar of motorcycles. I want you to think about coming back with me. I'll be looking at the people in the street, that their parents helped to kill us. My name is Carl Shapiro. I'm coming here because uh, I want to find out something that happened about my past. My father and my mother walked four or five nights. Looks like nobody's been here in 50 years. Another memory that went down the drain. I opened up the clump of hay and I let myself down into the hiding place. Next time we get off this train, we're gonna be in Ukraine. I don't want to bring hatred into my life. I don't want it to surface. We're not killers, but if someone wants to kill us, we'll kill them, period. There's scratch marks on the wall. There's a fear. Fear if they hear any noise, they come and they discover you. Not only you'll be killed, but all of us will be killed. Paulina! <laughs> you can't talk to your wife, to your children. I can't understand it. Carl, this is the barn. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the program. Uh, boy, that trailer you just watched it is incredibly, incredibly powerful. powerful. It, it is the trailer, trailer for a feature, a feature documentary, documentary called The Barn. And the, barn. And and the director, director of this film, film Phil Berger, Berger, is with us from New York State. Phil, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having us, friends. So uh, just an incredibly uh, powerful project. Uh, this is, uh, why don't you give people a little background? It, the story itself is, it, it's, it's basically unbelievable yet true. Sure, let me just give a little backdrop before I even talk about the film. Um, we are in the final years of having actual survivors from the Holocaust be amongst us. I'm a first generation American. My father was a survivor. He passed away exactly 10 months ago. Um, at the age of 91, he had me very late. He was a young teenager uh, in the Holocaust. He went through four concentration camps. Um, he started his life in America um, in his, you know, 30s. And, and he created a life that I don't know how he did it. Uh, I don't know how any survivor did it. I don't think I would have been able to do it. Um, but regardless, uh, to honor him, um, I was contacted about this film, and I figured this would be a wonderful way to, to really represent uh, these last survivors. So what we made was um, potentially one of the last consequential um, Holocaust documentaries because you don't have firsthand accounts anymore. So I was contacted by uh, one of the producers, Matthew Hiltzig, who is a, a big uh, PR uh, guy in, in the entertainment industry. Um, and he was approached by a teenager, Rachel Kastner, um, who uh, was just graduating high school. And uh, her grandfather, um, Carl Shapiro, is also a Holocaust survivor. He was a child who was hidden in, in the bunker of a barn for a year and a half. And there was 13 people who hid in this bunker um, and they survived. And it was absolutely incredible. And this bunker uh, was located in Poland, uh, in Carl's hometown. But with uh, the borders changing after the war, that bunker and barn was now somewhere in the Ukraine. But nobody knew its existence. The, the, the name of the town 
um, had changed and nobody had seen it since liberation in, in 1945. Uh, but when I was approached by the story, um, even though I'm not a full-time documentarian, I, it really touched me. And I figured uh, this might, there might be something here. But we've all seen the stories of the survivors going back to, um, you know, to, the, to their old hometowns uh, and meet the righteous Gentiles that were responsible for saving their lives. And we've seen the story and they're all very touching, um, but they're about five minutes in length. You know, there's tears, it's heartwarming, um, and it's a news segment. Um, but it wasn't necessarily a documentary. Uh, but giving it further thought, you know, we, we, we felt, well, what if we can actually find this barn that nobody has seen since 1945? Uh, but I'm in New York. Uh, the other producers are in New York. Um, so I went on a Google search and I found um, a genealogist uh, with PhD from the Ukraine with PhDs galore, um, a specialist in Holocaust, a specialist in, he spoke fluent Hebrew, he's not Jewish. Um, it was, he was really, truly amazing. And I gave him a few clues and I said, this is all we know, you know, what do you think we can find? And he said, it's, it's unlikely. And um, I said, well, you're hired. Let's, let's, give, it a, let's give it a day um, and see what can be found. And, and the survivor, Rachel's grandfather, Carl, didn't know anything about this. And I didn't hear from this genealogist for four months. And all of a sudden I get contacted and said, look, I, I, had, a, I had a break um, and I took your clues. And I went out of town, several hours out of town, to find this, and and I found it. And I said, that, that that's absolutely incredible. He showed me pictures. It was it was mind blowing. It was absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> so now uh, the filmmaker in me figured out how, what is the most compelling way to structure this as as a documentary. And um, I don't like doing anything conventionally. Uh, and I did not want to create a documentary which is just a bunch of interviews and talking heads and you know some B-roll, said, what can we do to make it interesting and exciting and compelling? So rather than the end of the documentary, having Carl go back to uh, Poland to meet Paulina, who was, who was the righteous Gentile in Yad Vashem in Israel, credited with saving his life and that of 12 others, rather than that being the end, what if we made that the beginning? of the documentary and he had refused he was so against going back because there was just too much pain involved just too much pain and he refused for 70 years um but his granddaughter uh was quite precocious and insisted on it and not only insisted on it um you know planted the seeds for there to be a documentary about it so we didn't tell him anything about finding the barn but we did say, we're going to go back and you're going to meet Paulina, who they had written letters to each other over the last few decades, but nothing, uh, nothing discussed as of, you know, him coming there and having a meeting or just, you know, just reminiscing or, or, or anything because it was just too raw for him. But we convinced him to go back and uh, we had a little team of five and we went and they met and it was, it was, uh, it was amazing. Um, you know, tears were flowing. Um, it was funny. Once we got there, Paulina said, I will meet with him. And she's the sweetest old woman. She passed away a couple of years ago, but she's the sweetest old woman. She would meet him, but she didn't want any cameras. So we just flew all the way over here with cameras. <laughs> and we had a, a Polish camera crew meeting us and we were having a Ukraine camera crew meeting us in Ukraine. And she said, no cameras, but you know, she, she, we convinced her to allow a stationary camera in the corner of the room that somehow got it. Um, and then it, it got nudged and it was, it was, that one little scene was a mess, but everything else is, is absolutely stunning and gorgeous. But that meeting was absolutely incredible. And when that meeting ended, we asked Carl if he would like to try to find his old hometown, which was now in Ukraine. And he of course said no, but you know, we're pretty convincing. And Without his knowledge, we then took a sleeper train for 12 hours from Krakow, Poland, 
to Lviv, Ukraine. Um, and I had it prearranged already, but he didn't know what was coming. And what we started to do, and we as the filmmakers did not know what was going to come because we couldn't do any advance on these locations. We didn't know who the crew was going to be, aside from the names. Um, we didn't know what we were walking into. And Ukraine wasn't, Western Ukraine wasn't dangerous, but it wasn't smooth sailing. You know, it wasn't as dangerous as Eastern Ukraine at the time, but it wasn't smooth sailing. We had uh, we had an armed security guard go with us because we, we needed to, um, you know, make sure that we weren't going to be, you know, in, in total danger. Uh, but we went um, and every location that we loosely had set up for the next shoot, we didn't know what was going to come from them. We knew that each person that we were meeting had information, um, but we let it go in um, in real time and, and to see how Carl was going to react to it and what information he was going to draw from it. And slowly but surely, even though we didn't know exactly how it was going to play out, it's not scripted, it's a documentary, every location that we went to, every person that we met, we met with mayors of tiny towns we everyone gave us more information oh here's someone who's 92 years old who was around that time they might have more information and we went there um and lo and behold it those seeds planted took us ultimately to the barn at the climactic scene where carl actually entered <laughs> the door to the place that hit him as a child for 18 months and he wasn't above ground. He didn't have, he didn't see daylight for 18 months. When I say it was a bunker, it was a dirt hole in a ground that barely fit 13 people and he didn't see the light of day. And when we went in and this, this was the most incredible moment um, I, 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 I could have, I, I, I could think could have happened with this. The reaction that everyone anticipated from Carl we got the complete opposite. We thought he would be exhilarated. We thought he would have closure. We thought this would be the absolute most phenomenal feeling he would have, knowing that he was on this hunt with us. And I'm not going to give away the ending, but it it turned everything upside down. It was it was it was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. But ultimately, we were able to create a documentary that was shot in, in active tense. Nothing about this documentary is past tense. These aren't interviews with talking heads saying, then this happened, then that happened. We created an active journey, a granddaughter-grandfather story of their bond. Um, and it ultimately turned into a mystery movie. But it was real. Uh, it just is a fascinating story. In one of the write-ups of one of the festival screenings, it said, it has been nearly 70 years since the Holocaust massacred 6 million Jews and exponentially more in the generations that never were. And it's such a succinct way of saying that the ripples of that tragic, tragic story in history uh, will be felt for millennia. Uh, and your, boy, your personal story, but you're 100% right that sadly every day, uh, the few remaining survivors are leaving us. Yep, and, and that's why it's important to have these stories so that it can continue teaching, so it can continue showing what happened because those last few survivors, that, that's our last connection. And I believe, I think it was just a few years ago where um, the statistics showed that we, the Jewish population just now reached the number that they were before the Holocaust. So, so that was the, the actual black and white devastation. Um, and yeah, at this stage, it, it's really about carrying on these stories and, and never forgetting, never forgetting what happened. And my father suppressed it. It, was, it hurt him so much, he couldn't talk about it. You know, I had so many relatives that were killed in this. And, you know, people think about it as, you know, oh, it's just part of the history, but these, this is, this was my grandmother. 
you know, who I never met, you know, to my uncle who I never met. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, but this is what happened. And now, now it's up to us to, to carry on these stories. And, and I credit Rachel for, for, you know, making it real to the point where we figured out a way to retell the story in a very original, original medium. The Barn is a fascinating project. Its director, Philip Berger, has been with us from New York State. Uh, Philip, thank you so much. And how uh, how do people see the film? Well, uh, it was it, it got distribution, and we were about to have a theatri theatrical release prior to COVID, and you know then theaters shut down. So I'm hopeful that once the vaccines become uh, a regular thing and theaters open up again, we'll get it back into theaters, and I'll get you that information. Fantastic. When that happens, we'll be sure to have you back on. We'll talk about it some more. Thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you, Brent. Uh, folks, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. A decade of war has taken an unprecedented toll on our men and women in uniform. Most veterans return to our communities as leaders, but everyone's journey home is not the same. Hundreds of thousands of our veterans are suffering from the trauma of war. Without assistance, the downward spiral can be quick and destructive. It doesn't have to be this way. At Justice for Vets, we believe that every veteran should have the opportunity for treatment and restoration. Justice for Vets is the only national organization dedicated to the expansion of Veterans Treatment Courts. Veterans Treatment Courts hold our veterans accountable for their actions. By providing structure, treatment, and mentoring, these courts help our veterans and their families get their lives back on track. And Veterans Treatment Courts work. We ask much of our men and women in uniform and they ask little in return. It is our collective duty to come to their aid when they struggle on the home front. This not only honors their sacrifice, but makes our communities stronger. A donation to Justice for Vets helps put a veteran's treatment court within reach of every veteran in need. A donation to Justice for Vets keeps veterans in treatment where they belong. A donation to Justice for Vets shows your commitment to leaving no veteran behind. A donation to Justice for Vets will help save lives, restore families, and rebuild communities. Get involved and go to justiceforvets.org. Veterans fought for our freedom. Now it's our turn to fight for theirs. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the program. And with us as every Monday, we're always grateful to have former state representative Karen Derry. How are you this morning, Karen? I'm great. How are you, Brent? I am uh, happy that it's February. Uh, as folks who live here know, we actually have a quite a cold spell coming. It's going to be in the single digits this weekend. I've got my thick woolly jumper on right now. Um, but we're here to talk about school vouchers. Uh, this last week at the Iowa Capitol, so here's how the, the Waterloo NBC station headlines it. School voucher bill giving public money to provide education passes narrowly through the Iowa Senate. Uh, Ms. Derry, why don't you tell folks what happened, what's going on? Yeah, well, that's a good way to, to describe it. Um, there is a bill making its way through the legislature. It has passed through the Iowa uh, Senate, has not passed through the Iowa House yet. Uh, and the bill basically does three things. One is it establishes voucher programs in the state of Iowa. Uh, secondly, it um, eliminates diversity plans um, in some of our public schools. And, it, and third, it establishes charter schools. And certainly the voucher component of it is probably what's getting the most attention. Basically what it does is it creates educational savings accounts. That's what they're called uh, for students who are attending uh, schools in, in certain schools. And those uh, certain schools are schools that uh, according to you know criteria established by the uh, Board of Education are in the lowest 5%. Uh, the lowest five percent performing schools in the state of Iowa, um, and in adding in the state of Iowa to that description is is really important uh, because you know, Iowa overall has pretty good public schools, um, and so in fact, Governor Reynolds recently cited a U.S. News report that said 
uh, that were ranked number 14 in the nation. So pretty good public schools. We used to be ranked a lot higher, but that's before we started underfunding our public schools for a decade. Um, but um, it's these lower performing schools um, in Iowa. So we're not compared to schools in you know, the 50th ranked state in, in the country. It's only, you know, schools in Iowa, which means that some of what, you know, honestly, what some of these Republican lawmakers are describing as horrible, awful, failing schools um, in other states, you know, would maybe would be in the an average school. Um, so, you know, to call them all failing schools, I think is, is, is really misstating it. But in any case, um, it establishes these um, educational savings accounts uh, that, that travel with the student. It's $5,270 per student per year that they can take and uh, apply to you know, tuition at a private school or to tutoring fees or testing fees, um, that type of thing. Um, that money can be rolled over year to year as well. So if the student, uh, the student's family doesn't roll it, doesn't use it all in one year, they can roll it over to the next year. And for students who are, you know, being homeschooled, um, you know, there might be money that is rolled over from year to year to year that's not in public dollars that aren't even being used up uh, in order to educate Iowa students. So it uh, it says narrowly passed Iowa Senate twenty six to twenty one, and uh, Iowa State uh, Auditor Rob Sand is actually going to be a guest on this uh, show on this Friday. He released a statement. He goes, Iowans should be alarmed that the proposal for vouchers contains no independent audit provision and no audit requirement uh, whatsoever. The public will have little ability to see what is happening with their tax dollars and less protection from fraud and abuse. So basically, they're going to hand folks 5000 bucks and just hope it goes to the right spot. Or how do they find out if it's going to a school of any note? Can someone just, you know, unfold a, a, a card table in their living room and say, this is the school, give me $5,000? And that's one of the biggest concerns with these charter schools is that, you know, the local elected school board uh, does not have to approve these charter schools. Um, you know, and, and, and private schools, charter schools, they don't have to follow the same rules that our public schools do. So, for example, they don't have to accept students uh, with disabilities. And students with disabilities are very, very expensive um, to, to have in our public schools. And as a state, we've decided that that's an investment. That's something that we, that we want to do. Um, but what, you know, what happens then with these charter schools, with, with these voucher programs for these public schools, is that that money gets funneled away from the students who might be a little less expensive to educate. And we're left with our public schools with the students who who are more expensive to educate. A proposal that's been floated by several people is that you know, if you're gonna do this, at least, at least make these schools subject to the same requirements that our public schools are. And that, that was proposed uh, as an amendment in the Senate and voted down. Uh, State Senator Sarah Garriott, uh, she said, the voucher portion of the bill is basically money laundering uh, intended to skirt equal rights protections for Iowa students. And it just, it the sad part about it is the schools that need the funding the most not are going to lose the funding. You know, America's uh, an interesting country in that our money that goes to our school districts is derived from property taxes. So if you live in a nicer neighborhood, your public school has is, is got more resources. And so this will, not only will this take, a, it'll just be damaging to the to the schools that need it the most. Isn't that true? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's so distressing. I mean, these are the schools, if they are the lower performing schools, these are the schools we should be investing in and trying to make better. You know, another um, you know, unfair part of this bill is that it's going to benefit people who can already afford to send their kids to private schools. Tuition at Dowling uh, Catholic, you know, our Des Moines area uh, Catholic school is just shy of $12,000 a year. So this $5,000 isn't going to cover that. Uh, so, you know, families that don't have the, the, the means to make up that difference, they can't take advantage of it. Um, only 200 and, no, 240 out of 327 of our school districts in Iowa don't even have a private school in the district. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So for stu students in those districts, it's only going to be those um, families who can afford transportation uh, to uh, one of these private schools who's going to be able to, you know, take advantage of it. So it's it's so unequal in so many ways. It doesn't fix the problem that that its supporters claim that it fix, fixes. It's not going to help these students and these these lower income students in these in these schools that are, you know, not doing as well. Is this is this Iowa's new version of white flight? Well, that's exactly the concern with the um, elimination of the diversity plans. Uh, right now, there are five schools in the state of Iowa that um, that have these these voluntary diversity plans, and they can use those to say to you know to to um, monitor white flight so that not too many you know what, you know we can keep the 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 balance closer in our public schools in these districts. And, you know, the bill does away with that. So absolutely. It's, it's like publicly financing resegregation of our school in Iowa. Yeah. And it just, uh, you know, at a base level, it's saying we have a problem over here, but instead of fixing it, we'll give you some money to go over here and go into private industry. It just, it just goes completely against the tenets of public education in this country. Exactly. It, it complete and it exacerbates the problem that already exists. And yeah, it does nothing for the common good. It's just consistent with that. You know, it's all about me approach that unfortunately we see happening so much in our state these days. Former state representative Karen Derry, thank you so much for being on today and explaining that to us. I certainly do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brent. Have a good week. You too. And folks, uh, as I mentioned, State Auditor Rob Sand will be on this program on Friday. On Wednesday, we're going to have on Andreen Ward Hammond, who co-stars with Brian Cranston on Showtime Show Your Honor. On Thursday, Brendan Gutenschwager, that amazing footage I showed you, he was there at the Capitol on the 6th. He's also been in Seattle at their riots recently. He's going to tell you what it's like to be uh, right there uh, filming these uh, harrowing events. All that and so much more this week. I uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome Welcome to February, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.